a girl in a hat She's got me going up and down She's got me going up and down After the pub shut, we go out and to the cider farm, get some cider and turn out on the seafront and you'd have coach loads of brummies and Bristol kids or whatever like, you know, they'd all come down having a, having, having a drink themselves and we'd be shouting things across, they'd be doing the same and then we'd just go for it in the middle. Until the law come along or whatever and we usually be the ones that get arrested because the police knew us, like, so we'd be the ones that arrested and they'd usually get away with everything. <laughs> Sixteen youths appeared before Western Super Mayor magistrates this morning and fines of up to £300 have been imposed. Getting fined that much is going to make them go out and nick stuff and sell it to pay off their fines. A lot of the lads did uh, time, they did got Borstal, etc, etc. Me, me, I was lucky, I had a, a full-time job at the time and I just pay, ended up paying up thousands of pounds in fines to know the years. I'd love to know where it went. I think the best one was, um, there must have been 50, 60 of us over on the uh, bingo steps, opposite the amusements. We all decided that we're going to go down to the um, Smith's Hotel, where all the Brummie skinheads were. There's about 100 of them down there. And uh, we met, in, met up with these 10 or 15 Bristol blokes, 20 Bristol blokes, whatever, and uh, decided that we're, we're going to do the Brummies together. So we all steamed into Smith's Hotel, kicked the crap out of the Brummies, and on the way back along the beach, we kicked the shit out of Bristol blokes. And that's when the police were chasing us along the beach on horses. The police started quite a fair bit of trouble, I'd say. Going in too heavy. Even on days when nothing happened, the old bill would be there pushing... And I'm not talking about just us, I'm talking about ordinary pedestrians on the street, like, you know? Pushing them all along the seafront to try and get them over onto the beach. Everyone was piling over the wall because the police was trying to push everyone away like from the sea from the seafront to get them on here out of the way. So uh, that's when we all jumped over the walls and whatever. They yeah, hadn't like all the Bristol lot was behind the police and they segregated both lots. So uh, that's how come we ended up on here that fateful day. It was really terrifying for everybody, for them, for the donkeys, the horses, and all the public with their little kiddies. They come on the beaches, they come about 400 at a time, and they would just make one run all the way and scream and shout. I put it down, the police, they used to send them down on the beach to take the trouble off the streets, up, you know, where all the posers was and that. The bank holidays used to spoil it. I mean, obviously the fighting used to spoil it for a lot of people. There was victimisation from the police. I mean, in them days, we were basically sheep ready to be herded up by them. We was out of order sometimes with them, and we did have the occasional scuffle with them. But uh, most most of the time, they just they just just loved picking on us because we basically had nothing else to do. Then there was a lot of a lot of bad feeling between us and the police. It, it didn't just happen in the summer. I mean, we got victimised in the winter. Uh, when there weren't the honey holiday makers around. They did enjoy picking on us and they knew that we never used to give up much of a fight in court and they, we just processed, basically.
It's all quiet on the Western Seafront these days. One, it wasn't always like two, this. Three. Twenty years ago, a gang of teenagers from a local housing estate terrorised the beaches. No bank holiday passed without a battle. They were called the Squad. I knew them in their heyday, all fanatical about Bristol Rovers, all mad, bad and dangerous to know. The stories are well documented by the press, police and the courts. But what about their own stories? Budgie, Daffy, Mountain, Sweat, Wally, oh and Tone. The characters are as vivid now as they were 20 years ago. The squad members all came from the notorious Bourneville estate, isolated from the town of Weston by the two main railway lines to the west, an estate full of bored young men. As luck would have it, I got the chance to come back 20 years later to listen to their stories and look back on those infamous days. I'd come from a tough club in Birmingham, expecting Western Supermare to be somewhere quite quiet. I was quickly enlightened that it wasn't, and um, it was just as bad as where I'd come from in the inner city. Well, it all started back in 74, 75, back at school. It was um, Wally Vowles, PG. He's, he's dead now. He had an accident at work. Uh, Daff and Sweat. The youngsters down here were considered to be quite uh, beyond control. But in, in the main, it's been my belief that um, Bourneville is not as bad as it's painted. Certainly from a youth club point of view, um, it wasn't as bad as some people thought. The club was just locked up on by the youngsters as a refuge, but unfortunately by the people who lived in the locality as a place where all the troublemakers gathered. We all lived on the bundle together. We had generations of different gangs. It was me and my brother was a skinhead. He was a few years older than me. We had his gangs and we used to just mix them together. And the squad used to look around with my lot. Okay, that was not the biker kid gang I used to knock around with, but I used to always knock around with the skinheads as well, funny enough. The frightening thing I can always remember was my mum shouting across the shops and telling me to get home. Because my mum was terrible. <laughs> Stop hanging around them shops. Get home. Shortly before I got uh sort of integrated with the squad. The states used to fight the states, the Bourneville used to fight the Mixon and the Bourneville used to come down to World and fight the World lads and vice versa. And then all of a sudden it, it changed and the Bourneville lads uh, started recruiting people from other parts of, of Western. I got into the, the skinhead uh, thing, I got my head shaved and uh, basically I got recruited in and uh, I was a full-time member then. I moved from Claverham down there, it's a totally different way of life. I either got learned to go with it, and I'd be hardened, or you just get pushed on all the time. So in the end, I just come come you know, where I was, and where I was out there, I had guns and bikes and everything else. And when I come here, it just totally ruined me life because my father took everything away from me. You're not allowed to have it because it's a tank. So in the end, I just rebelled against everything. The squad started off. We had, I don't know, all the schools like Whirl, Wyvern, Broad Oak. I think it happens everywhere in the country. We always have a little rumble with different schools and whatever. And as that happens, we all sort of left the school at the same time and we all ended up in town. 
So come the end of it all, we just all joined together. And uh, basically then the music started, and that's really when we all turned skinhead. I always used to carry a camera with me, I used to have a special pocket in my jean jacket, and I slid it in. A 110 camera, because you could carry it everywhere, no one could see it, and you could just pull it out on certain moments, and no one would know nothing about it. And uh, we took some good shots with it. A typical bank holiday Monday would be like, go to the shops, meet up there about nine, half nine, maybe have a kick about with a football or whatever for half hour or so till everyone's ready like get about eight ten maybe twelve of you over the shops like over the social club for a few cheap ciders because that was dynamite fuel no matter i don't care what anyone says that social club cider was the strongest in town and we get over there and, and like we meet up with another six to a dozen or whatever and then it'd be stroll into town Maybe via the Ancaster, depends which way we went. But we used to go into Ancaster quite regularly after a while because the police banned us from the social club. They, but they told the social club to stop serving a cider. So we all had to go to the Ank. And I had to pay an extra 10p a pint, which was murder. <laughs> We've got three million miles to reach on the moon. So let's start getting happy. When we actually got to town, we'd, we'd all sort of like go in the globe. Or the cavy, which was a Cavendish inn. Or the anchor, meet up with the anchor animals. They were a berserk bunch of animals as well. <laughs> they were a bit more mental than us. I don't want as many of them. <laughs> and then, like two o'clock, pubs are shut. Some people would have shot off during the afternoon, they got a few gallons of screeching for the beach. They would head down the lawns, unless there was a drinking competition in Max's, and we'd go and steam into that. Drink all the beer, fill in a few bikers. <laughs> and then head to the lawns then. And that was just wait and see what what was going on, like you know. the pub shut we'd go out and to the cider farm get some cider and turn out on the seafront you'd have coach loads of brummies and bristol kids or whatever like you know they'd all come down having a having, having a drink themselves and we'd be shouting things across they'd be doing the same and then we'd just go through in the middle all the skirts lapping up the sun lap me up why don't you until the law come along or whatever and we used to be the ones that get arrested because the police knew us like so We'd be the ones that arrested and they'd usually get away with everything. Like <laughs> Sixteen youths appeared before Western Super Mayor magistrates this morning and fines of up to £300 have been imposed. Getting fined that much is just going to make them go out and nick stuff and sell it to pay off their fines. A lot of the lads did uh, time, they did got Borstal, etc, etc. Me, me, I was lucky, I had a good, I had a full-time job at the time and I just pay, ended up paying up thousands of pounds in fines to them over the years. I'd love to know where it went. I think the best one was, um, there must have been 50, 60 of us over on the bingo steps opposite the amusements. We all decided that we're going to go down to the um, Smith's Hotel where all the Brummie skinheads were. There's about 100 of them down there. And uh, we met, in, met up with these 10 or 15 Bristol blokes, 20 Bristol blokes, whatever, and uh, decided that we'd, we'd go and do the Brummies together. So we all steamed into Smith's Hotel, kicked the crap out of the Brummies, and on the way back along the beach, we kicked the shit out of Bristol blokes. And that's when the police were chasing us along the beach on horses. The police started quite a fair bit of the trouble, I'd say. Going in too heavy, 
even on days when nothing happened, the old bill would be there pushing. And I'm not talking about just us, I'm talking about ordinary pedestrians on the street, like, you know, pushing them all along the seafront to try and get them over onto the beach. Everyone was piling over the wall because the police was trying to push everyone away from the sea from the seafront to get them on here out the way. So uh, that's when we all jumped over the walls and whatever. They had not like all the Bristol lot was behind the police and they segregated both lots. So uh, that's how come we ended up on here that fateful day. It was really terrifying for everybody, for them, for the donkeys, the horses, and all the public with their little kiddies. They come on the beaches, they come about 400 at a time, and they would just make one run all the way and scream and shout. I put it down the police, they used to send them down on the beach to take the trouble off the streets, that, you know, where all the posers was and that. The bank holidays used to spoil it. I mean, obviously the fighting used to spoil it for a lot of people. There was victimisation from the police. I mean, in them days, we were basically sheep ready to be herded up by them. We was out of order sometimes with them, and we did have the occasional scuffle with them, but uh, most, most of the time they just, they just, just loved picking on us because they basically had nothing else to do. Then there was a lot, of, a lot of bad feeling between us and the police. It, it didn't just happen in the summer. I mean, we got victimised in the winter uh, when there weren't any holidaymakers around. They did enjoy picking on us, and they knew that we never used to give up much of a fight in court, and they, we were just processed, basically. Keep looking you for the same old thing. In the end, those just come out of office licences, walk up the road, we go on the side of them, and the next you know, a right van pull up, you and your neck for the day under suspicion. Though. It's a suspicion of what? A suspicion of causing a fray. And if you get in the van, you'll be locked up all day. Then let you go out late at night. I got nicked one bank holiday, the Friday before bank holiday actually, and because it was a bank holiday Monday on on the following Monday, the, the courts decided to put me in prison for three weeks so that I wouldn't be out for that bank holiday Monday. There were lots of occasions when youngsters were picked up by the police who weren't really responsible. They were pulled in just because the police knew them and they happened to be in the locality when something went wrong. Bank holidays were the days when the pub shut at three, you know, everyone used to come out on here because you never had nothing else to do, didn't have nowhere else to go. So you'd be out here wandering around and that's when all the gangs and that would meet up. All your bikers, your mods, or whatever, whatever, whoever come to Western, they'd always end up here. This was the prime spot and it always went off. It's just inevitable really, until the pubs opened and it went dead, finished. Some boy could come around the corner, we had a little ding dong with a few weeks before. Something to do with John actually, and uh, he just let fire on him straight away. A couple of weeks uh, before the fight, I'd insulted the, the, the bloke's girlfriend, and uh, he threatened me on the spot there and then. He said, Get me. And uh, well, I'd forgotten all about it. And then, uh, come a bank holiday, we were all there on the steps. Uh, looking at the people going by and the trouble and stuff, and uh, he suddenly appeared from around the corner <laughs> uh, with all his Western biker friends, because there was a bit of tension in them days with the Western bikers. And he came straight up to me because I was sat at the bottom of the steps and offered me out for a fight there and then. And uh, I said, well, no, no, because it's a bank holiday and uh, yeah, there was police everywhere and hundreds of people. I offered to see him at the park later on that day. But uh, he wouldn't have it, and uh, he just suddenly swung a punch at me there and then, and uh, I got up, and lucky enough, Basil was there with the, with the camera and took those famous photographs. It happened so quick, I just got my camera out and clipped off free. I mean, a fight I mean, only lasts a minute if it's a long one, and it's all over, and that was that. I don't even know where the bloke went, actually. Um, the poor lad, uh, basically, I beat seven tons of shit out of him, basically, <laughs> like, you know. We ended up shaking hands down the alleyway. And he walked off very embarrassed. <laughs> I think we all scarpered before we got arrested for it. <laughs> I got a brownie point. <laughs> On my street cred. <laughs> my favourite memories of the bank holidays was the... Uh, well, it happened quite a few times, is when someone would spot there'd be a crew of mods arriving in town. 
they all should come in some numbers as well. I mean, some of them, like the 40 or 50 scooters all come in, and the word would go round, mods are here. And, like, you know, no matter how far or wide the lads were in town at the time, we'd all converge in Regent Street by the bingo steps. And my favourite moment was just, like, between 50 and 60 of us just screaming down Regent Street, like, because all these mods were coming at one, sort of, one far end. And we were right at the other, and we just took over the whole road and just 50 or 60 screaming skinheads and punks, like, just heading towards these mods. And they all slammed their brakes on and just did a big U-turn. And off they went, like, and they're absolutely wet in their pants. That's one of my favourites. Years ago, when we were down, when we were all skinheads, they had 2,000 mods turned on and took on 200 skinheads, but the skinheads won. So uh, that was all over within minutes because the police, the riot police and all the horsebacks and all that broke it all up. But it was all good fun. It was all a good day out, so I was happy with it. And then there's just good old-fashioned punch-ups and somebody might get a kick on the floor, somebody might get a boot in the head. But there was no, we had, we never carried weapons or tools or anything like that. It was fists, uh, fists and boots, strictly that. The Western turf was sacred ground for us. And I can honestly say that I can't remember anyone coming down from outside town and taking us on and winning, I can honestly say. I never got any severe beatings, and I don't know any of the lads who got any severe beatings. We was always outnumbered. You know what I mean, like, you know, probably we had about 50 skinheads. And uh, you get, like, three or 400 come down from Bristol. You know, and uh, that's quite funny looking back on it, to be honest. Like, you know, we used to get chased everywhere. <laughs> you know, have a little, a little dig on the beach here and there. You know, but you was vastly outnumbered. It was a good day out. It was a bit of fun. Yeah, and that was it. As we said, you went home to tea, and that was the day over. Yeah, well, the thing that comes springs to mind, it was a good pose. <laughs> and it was very fashionable, and uh, the, the music enhanced it all. You see uh, if, like, it's the guys in the specials with their rude boy haircuts and uh, the cut on, and you want to be like them. And, uh, and it all seemed to fit into the skinhead revival at the time from the late 60s. Uh, and I think, yeah, and it was, it, we definitely wanted to be someone as well. It was all part of being someone, which we, uh, which we wanted to be, because most, I mean, a lot of the lads were unemployed and they didn't have nothing to do with all their time, and they just wanted to be someone, and uh, the squad uh, enhanced that. It was a golden age, actually, it was to do with the music, and, uh, well, not just the scene at the time, really. I mean, I had some good times, I had some good mates. I thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it, actually, where well, they were the days of my youth. The best thing about it was there wasn't, there wasn't nobody was in charge of the squad, like, you know, there wasn't no leader or nothing like that. Everyone sort of, like, had the same respect for each other, you know, and if, obviously, if one person got into trouble, then it was one and all, like, you know. There wasn't ever a time when no one ducked a, ducked a fight or whatever, or, or shindig or something scuffle with the bill. But there's no gangs like the squad anymore. I don't think there ever will be. That was it. I'm glad actually, because I, like I like to think of us as a one-off elite. Unless there is a major uh, skinhead revival, skinhead punk revival in the future, I don't think there ever will be another squad or anything to match them. I think where the squad has stuck out on the, in the story is because they was really the last gang that used to hang around because things sort of changed then. It seems now you don't get so many gangs around but it's funny how the, the girls seem to be picking up on it now and you're getting girl gangs hanging around and, and doing the sort of things that boys used to do. And uh, walking like blokes and all. <laughs> Obviously times have changed now. You go down on a bank holiday Monday now, you can take your kids, I, I go there with my missus, I take my dog, I feel comfortable. Uh, there's no trouble. It was just one of those, it was one of those eras um, which people have basically grown out of now and it's, it's passed. I've always worked, so uh, it's, it's just that uh, I've got to channel my money now into the family rather than out having a piss up all the time. I mean, I, I still go out weekends, still see all the mates, still see all the old squad boys and that, but it's... Uh, 
little bit toned down now. These days I do regard myself as a respectable citizen, even though I might not look it. No, I've got two children to bring up. Very nice as well they are. And they've done me pride. Yeah, both of them. A straight shot. Really have done me justice. Good girl. Right, Dean, take your time. Look at the hole. Do your stuff. Good shot. The most important thing in my life is to uh, keep hold of most of the things I got, like my boats and that, my cars, and my rods and my dog. I like them, and I think they're the greatest thing you've ever seen is them staff or terrorists. Like, you know, once you've got one, you never want another one. The same, just have a good time. <laughs> Rock and roll. Put your braces together and your boots on your feet. And give me some of that old moon stamping. Get ready! We got three million miles to reach on the moon. They couldn't see us. We waited for them just to line up and hit them with the milk bottles. What was that talking? Um, no, we were all scored. Yeah, fucking right. And like we went back, we went back to the, we went back all the way back to West, and we got to the traffic lights. And a couple went, "Have you just come from Rome?" <laughs> yeah, he was just said, oh, "What are you, some kind of suicide squad?" And we went, "No, we're just a squad." <laughs> And there was me, Rayton, Chris Bowles, Ian Page, Dyes, the Bennett Brothers, Fuzzy Wicks, and Chris Bowles, that was it. That's all I need to kidnap them. Oh, I'm too. I'm too. Part of my very enjoyable misspent youth. <laughs> I don't regret a thing. In fact, if I could, could I'd go back and do it all again. It was it was great fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.